damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. A long December, and there's reason to believe Maybe this year will be better than the last I can't remember the last thing that you said As you were leaving And the days go by so fast And it's one more day up in the canyon Hey everybody, it's the Wrestling Life with episode 323 It's our final show of 2022 I'm Ethan and I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. <laughs> and as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast and on our last show of the year, as you said. Yeah. So as we are uh, recording this, we've already had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas holiday season. And um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we'd like to congratulate the World Cup winner. <laughs> Congrats, winner. Yes. And uh, you're preparing to dog sit for me. And I'm preparing to take a 47-hour flight to Japan. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a whirlwind week for uh, for you and your wife, going, going to and from Japan in like six days or something. Leaving on a Sunday morning. The flight leaves at like 6 a.m. or something. And we're getting back on a Friday night at like midnight. Um, so however many hours that is. Uh, yeah, it's quite something. It's, <laughs> it's something that probably shouldn't be done. But anyway. Decision, decisions were made. <laughs> Tickets have been bought. It's too late now. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That's the way it's going to go. But anyway, enough about me. We are here to discuss some of the biggest news stories of the year. And you've come up with a list of eight of these that I think are the eight biggest stories of the year. And uh, then a few here and there um, that we can kind of touch on as we wrap up. But uh, how did you want to go about going through these uh, arbitrarily selected but accurate eight biggest stories of the year yeah so i mean we could go in like we'd have to probably should have done some research off the air to get like dates for all of these because i don't think i put them in like date they happened order i mean i can chronologically put these together for you real quick yeah that's i mean would you rather do it like that or should we like start with one of the big ones and with the other big one and Uh, i think let's do them chronologically okay and let me this is great pod <laughs> um i can uh go through here and hang on you know you want to pad for a second while i uh <laughs> get ready to copy paste this and send it to you sure well, listen, like actual stuff for the show or just like riff? I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, Well, it's been a year. <laughs> and this oh. is... <laughs> it's going to be yeah. the worst. Um, no, it is. It's what I think is great about this year in pro wrestling is that uh, there are eight stories that we're going to talk about today, as Ethan mentioned, and any one of them in its own year with maybe one or two exceptions would have been like the slam dunk. No question. Biggest story of the year. One of the biggest stories of the last five years. In a few cases, the biggest story of the decade, but they happened in 2022 where all of these other insane things happened, which I think is wonderful because we've had, we have a couple of stories here, which obviously the, the there's one, gigantic one that we'll get to in a couple minutes here that's gonna it's the biggest story maybe in the history of wrestling (laughs) yes and and, uh and certainly of the last 30 to 40 years in pro wrestling and then and then we have several other ones that would be the biggest story at least of their year in other years 
and uh, getting getting to recap all of these. It's one of those things where I I thought I remembered everything crazy or noteworthy that happened this year. And then I looked back at something. I just looked at like our episode titles and descriptions of what we talked about this year. I'm like, oh, my God, that happened this year. <laughs> it's one of those yes. types of years. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. So that's what happens when. Yeah, this uh, every month of this year has had its own biggest story of the year uh, contender almost. That is accurate. Uh, Cody left. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is uh, chron- I'm sending it to you chronologically. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to lead the? the list? Yeah. Why uh, not? I'll just go. Classics. Mm, yes. yes. One Interesting. Of those, one of our classics. <laughs> yes. All right. And so, without further ado, this is what going to be another one of our classic. Liam reads some li- reads a list of names and events, while Ethan solemnly. Uh, <laughs> makes uh noises of agreement or uh or <laughs> or disagreements one of our one of our classics and uh so kicking off we kicked off the year almost literally maybe the first day of the year within that first week uh with the news that uh that Cody I guess it wouldn't be with the first week it would have been it was in the first month of the year that Cody Rhodes and Brandy the founders co-founders of AEW were leaving this kind of bleeds from the end of of, uh, of 2021 when uh, Cody won TNT Championship and then was on TV and all of a sudden a report at the start of the year from, I believe, Fightful comes out saying Cody's working without a contract. And all of a sudden he disappears for a couple of weeks. Sammy walks on the TV with an interim TNT belt, which had never happened before this 2022 was the year of the interim belt but uh but at the time that was not a normal thing for AEW to do and then all of a sudden all right cody's back we're gonna do a ladder match for both belts sammy wins it and like the next day cody and brandy are out and with the word being that not only are they gone they're specifically or cody at least is going back he's going home he's going back to the fed and going back to wwe this at the time was like earth shattering that uh, that Cody was going back. Yeah, it was a big deal. He won the TNT title, of course, on Christmas night. Ah, yes. On on an episode that aired. It was taped like a week earlier, but it aired on Christmas night last year. And uh, then uh, he got COVID. And then uh, I think he dropped the title back to Sammy in like the third week of January. And then the story broke. And then there was a good eight weeks or so there where it was like, we think he's going to WWE, but we don't know that he's going to WWE. But what if he doesn't go to WWE? But what he <laughs> kind of has to go to WWE, WWE. He doesn't have any leverage. But also, does WWE now knows he doesn't have any leverage because mm-hmm. he's negotiated this severance or whatever it was with, with AEW? Anyway, everyone addressed a wonderful statement baby facing each other <laughs> i'm sure there sure there were ndas signed and so we'll never under we'll never get the the real story here's the thing about having a very litigious uh i don't know how litigious the Khan family is but mm-hmm. surely they are not at the very least they are not afraid to imply that they're willing to be very litigious <laughs> <laughs> And so I think there's a lot of NDAs signed all over the place. And uh, we will never get the full story of who hated who, what was the straw that broke the camel's back. Cody's savvy enough wrestling politically that he's never going to outright bury anybody anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, And Tony just wants to be everybody's friend. So... Sure. He's America's best friend in, in many ways. <laughs> um, but you broke it down on the side of the road. <laughs> he will change a tire for you. Yes. He, he and his dad will get you a new car bumper. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, the, the, the shining highlight of this is the week before the ladder match, Cody's last promo in AEW, and he just gives his, his state of the network speech. Yes. And 
it at the time was so bizarre. I remember us talking about it on the show and asking each other, what the hell was that? Yes. Because he rambled. He talked about one of the, he brought up CM Punk and how Punk said he was going to leave and go to New Japan and Ring of Honor and and, you know, build, you know, build something else and get out of WWE. And then he didn't. But Cody he, did. He took an underhanded shot at Punk. Yes. Or and, underhanded is not correct. I don't want to make it sound like he was. I think it was very clear that he <laughs> he saw where he was falling in the pecking order and didn't like it. And so he mentioned that he talked about, you know, he called out some other people. He mentioned, you know, the idea that another we would let another wrestler call themselves Brody in this co- is in this company is is very strange to him or something like that. Uh, or you yep. better, you better live up to that name. Um, uh, and, and there's just a lot of different lines across, you know, that didn't make sense. And we're not about building up a letter match with Sammy Guevara. And, yep. and then when the news broke, you went, Oh, because that's the last time he knew that was the last time he was going to have a microphone in his hands <laughs> on, on AEW television. And so he got whatever, he hadn't gotten off his chest, off his chest. Um, and and then, yeah, he, he obviously he went to WWE, had a somewhat short lived run there. They they brought him in as a big, big star. They treated him like a big star. They gave him the type of entrance and fanfare that they only give to people <laughs> that they think are big stars. They yep. didn't they didn't 50 50 him. they let him beat Seth Rollins three months in a row on pay-per-view. Uh, including when they know he was hurt and was going to miss at least six months of time. They still had him go over in that hell in a cell. Um, so, I mean, like, and he looks poised as we go look towards the new year to obviously everybody's eyeing the rumble for him, but certainly by WrestleMania, you have to think that he's factoring in the big plans for that show and whether, whether the Roman Dwayne dream match comes to fruition or not, some, when that match is over and both those guys go home, there's got to, there's going to be a, going to have to be another de facto top guy who holds, holds the flag, the full timer flag. And that's probably going to be, I mean, that's, I think that's what Cody's wanted. I think that's what he always wanted was to be, to be given the football and, and, and be, and be a top guy. So now he, he's got his chance, even if he doesn't quite get to, live out his father's uh, version of that, where he's both the top guy and, and the, you know, a guy calling the shots at the same time he gets to potentially, you know, get, get that top guy world championship spot that he's never gotten in any other company, except for ring of honor, which doesn't count anymore, I guess. Guy that brought him in though, at least as of this recording is not in charge. And the guy in charge is a guy he took a shot at on pay-per-view. It's true. He did break that throne with a sledgehammer. One of the least subtle things to ever happen. <laughs> and think of the ground that covers in the wrestling business. Um, mm. But yeah, that, 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 that makes Cody's 2023 very, very interesting. But yes, at the time, it felt like just him leaving was a huge story, which it was. But then it, it bled over into, you know, could Cody Rhodes actually complete the the movie fairy tale story of being told that you're a mid Carter for life here, kid and going out and then coming back as an even bigger star and, and, uh, and winning and winning, winning the world title and all that is like, well, it's a nice story. Even if it only happened because maybe he saw the writing on the wall at AEW of where he was going to be positioned as a television character. And also that the amount of power he was actually able to wield in AEW dwindled, <laughs> very yep. very rapidly over over the company's relatively short amount of time um i think oh yeah it could be any number of a thousand things that led to it but that's uh that's the first of our <laughs> of our uh eight stories here and uh moving on to another one that's uh an aew focused story that being Tony Khan announcing that he had in the middle of the ring on dynamite after previously vowing to never appear on television uh, announced that he had purchased Ring of Honor. Of course, Ring of Honor had basically sh- closed up shop at the end of 2021. The future was very uncertain. They fired everybody that they had under contract. 
uh, their belts were being defended in like triple A and impact and stuff. Um, and they had said they were going to run this WrestleMania weekend show, but nobody knew who was going to be on it or who was going <laughs> to, who was going to book it. <laughs> um, and here comes, here comes America's best friend again to, to save the day. And, uh, and he, he buys ring of honor and he puts uh, Brian Danielson versus Chris Daniels in the ring right afterwards. And while at the time this didn't really lead to a lot, it did lead to a few Ring of Honor pay-per-views happening with some pretty critically acclaimed FTR Briscoe's matches. And then the bigger sticking point, I think for most people, negative or positive, mostly negative, I would say, is that Ring of Honor became a fixture on AEW television, including in the uh, two Baltimore tapings that I, I went to of AEW television this year. Yeah. And when it happened, they're like, well, I think he bought a dead brand. And then <laughs> uh, he did his best over the next, um, th- he announced this in March. So over the next nine months or so on AEW TV, it was primarily on Rampage, mm-hmm. uh, a show that has run off viewers. <laughs> In huge numbers all year long. But um, he did his best to keep the brand alive or revive the brand or. Not sure exactly the best way to to phrase that, but. uh, And then by the end of the year, ROH is once again airing on Honor Club. They that was where weekly Ring of Honor television will be airing. They may or may not continue to run pay-per-views. I'm not sure. And um, looks like at this point, he bought a dead brand. And uh, his titles are on pushed AEW guys. So I assume we're still going to see ROH stuff pop up on uh, Rampage here and there. But I don't think this worked out particularly well for Tony. And um, I don't know if he would have been better served not buying it or buying it and shutting it down. Or buying it and regrouping before just putting all this stuff on AEW TV all year. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the best way to do this would have been. I'm not saying you shouldn't have spent the money at all, but buying it and trying to run it as a company without television, except putting it on his other television show, was the choice that he made. I'm not sure it's the choice that I would have made. And by the end of the year, I think it was largely uh, not successful. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know how the story ends, and he still has the video library when it's all over. So I don't think we need to take up a collection for him. But <laughs> as far as creatively, I don't think this has worked out very well. Yeah, and I guess the story at the time was if they didn't buy it, WWE was going to buy it. For right. it. And obviously they weren't going to run it. They were going to just take the tape library and throw it on Peacock and nobody would ever think about it again. Right. Um, so I understand why as, you know, as Tony fancies himself like a, a curator of wrestling, a, you know, a, a wrestling connoisseur, especially that America's era. best friend. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's another thing he fancies himself. Um, he, he wanted to, you know, make sure that was in the hands of somebody who cared about ring of honor that's a a noble cause theoretically and obviously you can now with the amount of talent you have that has spent time in ring of honor you do have a lot of tape history hey you own all in now the the show that created AEW uh that they couldn't directly reference for the first <laughs> two and a half years they existed um yeah, so there's there's reasons I get why to buy it for the tape library. But yes, trying to run it as a a separate brand, trying to get a new TV deal, any of that stuff, obviously, to this to this point, at least, has not worked out. So uh, that lead, led us to <laughs> I can't believe this is this. If, if we were going in like what made the most impact, this would probably also end up like fifth on the list <laughs> somehow. Yes. But we're talking about the biggest star in the history of professional wrestling, arguably, coming out of retirement and wrestling in the main event of WrestleMania 
Steve Austin in one of the most confusing and strange builds to a wrestling <laughs> match in professional wrestling history. Uh, Kevin Owens repeatedly uh, challenged Steve Austin to a fight. Uh, Steve, and then Steve, and then decided he was going to invite him on the Kevin Owens show instead, which is his talk show. At which point, Steve Austin sent in a uh, a clip saying, "Well, whether you want to call this a KO show or a match or a brawl, I'll be there." Uh, and then, uh, a- as going into WrestleMania, this was a talk show appearance, and uh, it went on last on night one of WrestleMania. And they're sitting in the ring; they're doing shtick. And uh, and then all of a sudden it becomes a wrestling match and Steve Austin wrestles for about 12 minutes and takes bumps on the stage and and, uh, you know, wins with a stunner. So it was it's it's a it's the definition of what WWE is thinking of when they think of a WrestleMania moment. Right. But, yeah, somehow the biggest star of all time coming out of retirement is like the seventh craziest thing that happened this year. Yeah, if it were me, I would have had uh, I would have advertised Steve Austin having his last match ahead of time. <laughs> I would have had him live in an arena on television at least one time building mm-hmm. to the match. WWE did neither of those things. I guess the explanation or justification was, well, Steve's old and uh, the match probably ain't going to be no good. So we don't want to advertise it. But if you get it as a bonus then you can't be disappointed if you spent money to see this. I think that's like galaxy brain thinking. I think, yeah, I think you need to advertise Steve Austin having his last match. <laughs> I was going to say, I saw as, as it turns out, as it turns out, not his last match, but uh, or probably <laughs> not his last match because he might be working some more uh, next year, but never yeah, say anyway. never brother. I was going to say, I watched Viano Four wrestle at triple mania this past year. Yeah, And let me just say, Steve Austin, you can announce an old guy who can't do anything is going to wrestle and people will still get excited about it. <laughs> and it'll still be a good match, even though he can't do much. Like, <laughs> And as it turned out, I think, yes, Steve Austin may be over delivered on what people expected as far as taking the suplex on the stage and things like that. But um, yeah, they, they it was a good bit of smoke and mirrors and, and Kevin Owens again that's a fun f you to people like you know jim Cornette or cm punk or anybody who didn't like that guy and said he was unprofessional and a slob and was never going to be anybody because he didn't take anything seriously it's like well he got the main event wrestlemania against steve austin so (laughs) how's your territory doing it's kind of one of those moments for so it's a big dream fulfillment for ko and then yes it's it could end up just being the first chapter in a lengthier comeback for Austin, but yeah, just kind of one of those, the damnedest things you've ever seen. And then he gave, uh, then he gave Vince the worst stunner of all time uh, the next night on night two of WrestleMania. So a memorable the ground that covers, <laughs> just think of the stunners he's given Vince McMahon before. Uh, it was worse than the Linda McMahon stunner. <laughs> it was arguably worse than the Trump stunner. I agree. I think it was worse than the Trump one. Uh, I think Vince got a touch of the dizzies and uh, and got confused as to what bump he was supposed to be taking. But uh, yeah, it was a Vince, while. Vince also screwed up the cue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he heard Austin Theory's music and started uh, acting like like he heard Steve Austin's music. And then. Uh, yes. And then had to <laughs> react again when uh, when Steve's music actually hit. It was a, yes, just a because... mess of a segment. Because Vince wrestled on night two of WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> Not even cracking the list. <laughs> no. Vince McMahon also had an unannounced wrestling match at WrestleMania. Yes. Against Pat McAfee. Yeah. Which he won by punting a football into McAfee. Sort of. <laughs> After McAfee beat Austin Theory, mm-hmm. then Vince beat McAfee. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now McAfee's out of the company. <laughs> He's just on a break. Sure. We'll see. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was that was the highlight, so to speak, of WrestleMania weekend. And uh not and... counting the greatest wrestling match of all time, Johnny Knoxville versus Sami Zayn. <laughs> God, that was great. Ah, 
Well, we'll we'll be getting to that next in uh, in our first show of 2023. Uh, I I will make sure of it that that one gets brought up when we talk about the best matches and events of the year. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we have uh, the next the next big event to happen uh, was uh, one that I assume Ethan you have nothing to say about. Uh, that being when uh, on one uh, dreary Monday evening uh, in May in May the month of May. Uh, there was a a match apparently booked for Monday Night Raw. It was announced actually uh, just minutes before the show went off the air, which makes which gets funnier when you know the timeline of how this happened. Um, uh, where a six pack challenge was announced for a number one contenders match for Bianca Belair's uh, belt, and then uh, within like the first couple of minutes, it was made clear that. Uh, that match was going to change and it suddenly became a Becky Lynch versus Asuka main event. And uh, we would come to find out through the words of America's second best friend, Corey Graves, uh, <laughs> that uh, that Sasha Banks and Naomi had summarily uh, left. They had they had refused to compete in their in their scheduled match and had left the arena. And uh, we then got a, a very, uh, a very uh Vince McMahon worded statement about how yes. they had placed their belts down on uh, on on John Laurinaitis's desk and told and told him they weren't respected as tag team champions and that they were leaving and uh, and they threw in some stuff about how uh, basically saying it's fake and these two are marks uh, at the end for good measure there so Sasha and Naomi walking out and uh, maybe to uh, a bigger surprise even after an event we will talk about in a moment here to this point, they neither one has come back and it doesn't look like Sasha, at least Sasha is coming back anytime soon. No, I think they'll both be back at some point. I think WWE Sasha Banks is part of too many firsts in WWE history for them to let her stay out of the fold forever. And I think to maximize her, earning potential in life she needs to be in that company Mm -hmm. at some point again so that's a mutually beneficial relationship both sides will make more money with each other however in the short term i don't think there's anything wrong with sasha going out and making a lot of cash from outside endeavors whether that be acting or modeling or working for New Japan Pro Wrestling or working for AEW or whatever, Naomi could be back any day and it wouldn't be surprising. Um, so she's married to one of the most pushed acts in the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, but uh, uh, two people uh, saying they don't like creative and walking out hasn't really happened on this scale in uh in 20 years so somebody finally uh stood up to the old man and and walked out and uh certainly was a story <laughs> it created what i like to call capital d discourse yeah um, cuz there's a lot of people a lot of people who i would think would maybe know better but maybe that's uh, on me for thinking that way uh saying like how could you be such a mark for the WWE women's tag team belts that don't mean anything um, which I don't think was the point. Right. Um, when both, a, as as the story goes, both women were promised various things for WrestleMania. Yes. And then plans changed, pal. And uh, and suddenly Sasha and Naomi were thrown together in a tag match, and they yeah. agreed under the assumption that they would be given some time to try to build the division. And you could say that they should have known better than to take Vince McMahon at his word when he tells you that when he tells you he'll owe you one, but that is what they were told. And then they were told you're both going to win singles matches and you're going to wrestle and lose to the raw and SmackDown women's champions. Specifically, Sasha's going to lose to Ronda Rousey, a woman who injured Sasha Banks the last time they wrestled. Yeah, um, she hurt. She hurt her shoulder. Sasha kayfabe the injury so she could. 
so that she could so lose she... the tag championships <laughs> the iconics so she could first win the tag team titles the inaugural the inaugural there to be women's tag titles and then lose them and walk out of the company before well, we thought the bella twins were coming back all right <laughs> we had to get those belts on heels all right, I we're guess. not we're not re, we're not relitigating the, the 2019 walkout. We're re, we're, re, we're relitigating the 2022 one. But yes, sure. uh, for I think a lot of good reasons, and to my understanding, there was no promise of like, well, we'll do these singles matches, you'll both lose, and then we'll do a tag title match where those two challenge you, and you guys get your wins back. That was never on the table. No scenario like that. It was you're gonna lose. It's the way Vince McMahon has always booked all of his tag team champions, right? It's You're going to lose to get the singles champs more over. Right. If anything, they should have been happy that it wasn't in a handicap match. Right. Um, where they where they both lose at once. But no, that it, that that was the story. And a lot of people said they were marks for themselves and that they were crazy. And <laughs> and again, it, it, I feel like they were just looking at it as, as very short sighted. How could you care about the as if it were solely about the the women's tag championships and not wanting to be pinned while being the champions uh, considering they had done jobs to like I think they had already done a job to like Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley at this point um, and or one of the other one, one of the other three teams that was in that division at the time right so uh, it was clear that there was a lot about this and also Again, as we talked about, both of those women had been in the WWE system for a really long time and had been, again, promised years. Yeah. And yeah. had been had been promised things and had those things taken away multiple times before. So maybe it was a whole bunch of things. And it was also just happened to be the straw that broke the camel's back. And no, actually, in fact, it wasn't about them being marks for the women's tag team championships. Well, from there, we move on to uh, Sasha and Naomi's uh, revenge, uh, which is, of course, uh, the biggest story in the in the whole time we've been doing this podcast. The biggest story in wrestling since at least WCW closed down, if not longer, at least it's been I guess you could maybe say since Benoit. But um, Vincent Mann was uh was there was a wall street journal article that came out saying that there were allegations that vince mcmahon had perhaps uh had inappropriate workplace relationships and then paid for ndas to silence uh the women involved in those inappropriate relationships with them with him um which led to a first a temporary stepping down of his duties as a uh, as ceo but not his stepping down as a head of creative or as the guy running the shows every week, which was, was on full display as he immediately, the day these allegations started to hit, put himself on television repeatedly. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that all, that all happened. He booked himself when the, uh, the allegations first came out, he booked himself on a WrestleMania match. Mm-hmm. Just like his his kiss off his fair his farewell. Then uh, when all the stuff really started to get uh, steam, he uh, put himself on TV every week uh, to lecture the crowd to come out and get uh, the audience to ba- sing his song and bow down to him. Mm-hmm. And then he would lecture the crowd about the importance of the WWE tagging then now forever together. <laughs> and uh, or he would. Uh, just show how youthful and vibrant he was by jumping off, jumping out of the ring right. after almost tripping over the ropes. <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, these sorts of things happen. And then in the third week of July on a Friday at like four 30 PM Eastern time, he tweets, ah, I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I just think, I think right now is the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Eventually the pressure from shareholders, from his board of directors, became too much we even talked about it on the show in the like three months but this was bu- bubbling just underneath the surface i mean like the first wall street journal story had been done mm-hmm. but it looked like maybe he was gonna escape by we're like wow you know he actually i think is gonna get out of this and then it's like no even 
the guy who is more powerful in his industry than anyone is in their industry, except maybe Lauren Michaels in on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. It's like it's very much those two have a lot of similarities, uh, at mm -hmm. least in how they how they ran their shows and stuff. But uh, yeah, in the end, the money was too powerful. It was too much. Even Vince had to go. <laughs> he was forced out. And it was on a random Friday in July, and uh, Hunter and Steph, Steph, who had taken the leave of absence to be with her family, <laughs> came back as co-CEO, and Hunter, who had been demoted to the mailroom, uh, <laughs> returned as executive, first as executive vice president of talent relations, and then uh, head of creative and chief content officer. And Johnny East was a, a casualty as well, as in through these the board of directors doing an investigation, they found out that he had a. Uh, uh, Vince was passing Johnny his leftovers. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Johnny went down too. And so uh, Nick Khan and Stephanie McMahon were named co-CEOs. Triple H was C uh, CCO, Chief Content Officer. And uh, beginning in July, there was like a two-month process of uh, right before... Right before it's SummerSlam, in fact, this happened. Uh, anyway, there was like a two month process of Hunter like trying to rewrite television, and it led to all of these people that had been released by the previous regime coming back, and mm -hmm. Hunter doing his best, I think, to keep his word to people that he offered his word to, like <sighs> the Good Brothers, <laughs> and bringing back some of. His people, his guys, like the road dog mm -hmm. and um, the a lot of NXT talent. Basically, if you ever got a push in, in NXT, Hunter was going to do his best to bring you back. And eventually this will lead to William Regal coming back with a vice president in a vice president's role. And, mm -hmm. you know, just anyway, the guy who had been running the company for 40 years isn't running the company any isn't running the company anymore and uh he was undone by his penis <laughs> he won't be the first and he won't be the last yeah it's it's the it's it's just a type of consequence that you almost never see as light as the consequences are for Vince McMahon in this case because he still gets to be exorbitantly rich and live live his life and you know nobody's prosecuting him nobody's nobody's throwing tomatoes at him when he walks out of his weird apartment that looks exactly like his office <laughs> um you know he gets to live a pretty quiet life although as we as we talked about at the at the just a couple of weeks ago maybe it's not over yep maybe there's more uh drama maybe there's more arrows to be slung he in, wants uh, to come back in yep. 2023 but we'll We'll have to file that one under. We'll see. But as of now, yes, it was the, 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 the considered the, the greatest promoter. And I think that's a fair title for him. Uh, not the greatest creative mind, you know, but the greatest promoter in the history of pro wrestling, uh, the most powerful man in the history of pro wrestling. Uh, just, just let it all slip away. <laughs> and, uh, and it was it was pretty it's it's a pretty great shot in Freud uh, if I could uh, if I could invoke a little German um, <laughs> hoisted on a flagpole by his own uh, white boxer shorts with red hearts on them. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So it was a uh, yeah. It's it was uh, it's 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 been an insane few months, and if uh, fingers crossed, it gets even more insane uh, when he tries to come back. Yep. But uh, <laughs> from one insane old man uh, doing things he shouldn't be doing to <laughs> another, we move on to a little bit later in the summer there. We had actually the same weekend as, uh, as that <laughs> SummerSlam show. So right around the same time that Vince McMahon was being ousted. It's like <laughs> nine days later. <laughs> yeah. We have Richard Flair coming out of retirement again. Yep. To have one last match, he teams with his son-in-law, Andrade, a man who is really just a cool, normal guy. <laughs> is not insane. Um, doesn't do coke. Uh, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I said he doesn't. I said All he right. does not. 
Okay. As far as I know. All right. Um, do that. Uh, teamed with his son-in-law, Andrade. <laughs> and he, he wrestles uh, his old training partner and, and TNA protege, Jay Lethal. And who else could be Jay Lethal's tag partner? Who else would get themselves a piece of Ric Flair's last match? The biggest non-AEW or WWE show of the year. But the world champion, the reigning defending bag securer himself, Jeffrey Jarrett. The Double J worked SummerSlam a day before, and then he worked. <laughs> I forgot as he a, was at SummerSlam. As, as a guest ref, and then he worked Ric Flair's last match. Yeah, Ric Flair came back and wrestled at age 73. And he was very upset at the podcasters afterwards. <laughs> who all only reported on his comments that he passed out three times during the match and not on the fact that Shawn Michaels and Tony Khan had sent him congratulatory text messages. <laughs> he only passed out three times during the match. And what are you guys so upset about? You know? <laughs> yeah. And then he was like, well, maybe I should have drank more water and less <laughs> and not only drank Natty Light or whatever. <laughs> whatever rick's current drink of choice is um yeah it was it was a mess i did not watch the match in full but it, i think if you were on twitter that night you saw everything you needed to see i i, I watched it in full and uh it wasn't wasn't any good <laughs> jeff jarrett was the best worker in the match jeff jarrett's usually the best worker in that whatever match he's in but in every sense of the word he is the best worker isn't he yeah but you would think, look, how are we going to do a Ric Flair match? He's 73 years old. He's had all these health problems. Mm -hmm. Well, he should probably not do a damn thing except sell a little bit and uh, build to a hot tag where he hits some chops and puts somebody in a figure four. Well, he was so blown up by the time it came time to hit the chops and do the figure four that uh, he... I think that's one of the times that he passed out. <laughs> <laughs> he he got blown up like 30 seconds in, which was the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, And uh, rather than just go stand on the apron until the end of the match, he kept trying to do stuff. And it's like, well, he didn't do anything that he couldn't do, but he couldn't do anything. So, like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was I had extremely low expectations, but I thought given the mental acumen of everyone involved when it comes mm -hmm. to putting together a pro wrestling match, that it would have been better than it was. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're leaving out the part where he did pretend to have a heart attack <laughs> on the side of yeah. the ring in front of his daughter, not Charlotte, his other daughter, Conrad's wife. Yeah. Um, his daughter, his daughter, Megan and his carny son-in-law. Conrad. <laughs> and also, hey, and then hey. watched him. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, Karen Jarrett worked the show. I'm happy. Hall of Famer. <laughs> Hall yep. of Famer, my man. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, my my favorite part is the the shot where uh, he got he actually got several uh, legends of the game to come uh, to come sit front row, including uh, weird late in life uh, friend Bret Hart. <laughs> yep. Um, I think it's just because most of their uh, well, in Rick's case, all of his friends hate him. Or he or he burned a bridge with them, and uh, and in Brett's case, sadly, I think most of his friends are no longer with us. So, but there, Brett was there. Undertaker was there. Mick Foley was there. <laughs> yep. Shot of Brett watching, <laughs> watching Rick, uh, brawl with Jay Lethal outside the ring, and Brett just looks horrified. <laughs> He's yeah. just like I. Like, it looked like a man who thought he was witnessing a death. Like, yeah, like he was going to yeah. see another tragedy. Yeah. Brett doesn't have much of a poker face. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it was really scary. Most of that match was really scary. That's right. But uh, he's I, I hear on on whatever the latest iteration of his podcast is before he gets mad and fires another co-host or uh, or whatever uh, that he's uh, he's he's putting out feelers, l letting people know that he's he's thinking about one more. His second uh, annual last match. That's right. <laughs> and uh, he, him and Bischoff are sniping right now. So fingers he's, crossed. 
he's taking shots at people that are all happen to be on his son-in-law's podcast network, mm-hmm. Jim Ross and Eric Bischoff. Uh, so uh, work alert. I'm not sure what the work builds to, but work alert. Uh, JR and Eric on commentary while uh, while he wrestles uh, <laughs> Jeff Jarrett in a singles match. Probably, yeah. There Maybe it would, yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right, we're getting towards the the end of our list here. We have two more entries. Uh, the first of which being, uh, <laughs> you know, some interesting things happened this year in AEW, and uh, none none more tumultuous than uh, an an incident we didn't realize was an incident back in May of this year when Hangman Page made a offhanded comment in his go home promo against CM Punk setting up their world title match that uh, that Punk talks a big game about workers rights. He was he was alert uh, alluding to some comments Punk had made uh, publicly uh, where everyone could see them uh, about the Sasha Naomi situation. In fact, so it all kind of connects together. It's like poetry. It rhymes. Um, And and so that that statement was made. They had their match. Punk won. Punk got hurt, broke his foot, has to tearfully surrender the belt. Uh, John Moxley becomes the interim champion. We're about three weeks out from all out. CM Punk's back. All right. We're 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 on. We hit the ground running. We're ready. Right. It's a big time match. Everybody's excited. Punk's back. And Punk's first week back, he decides just randomly, the first thing he does before he talks about John Moxley or All Out or or any of that is uh, he offers to defend his championship against Hangman Page. And Hangman Page does not come out, at which point he calls Hangman Page a coward and uh, and then moves on with his life. Which again, everyone went, well, that was strange. And then we began, we began to untangle this, this wild web that we have weaved in AEW this year, uh, where we began to understand that there was a punk faction and an elite faction. And uh, punk, it was coming to a, it was slowly but surely coming to a boiling point as uh, there were several uh, talent meetings over those weeks, several rah-rah speeches were given. And uh, uh, all of this coming from the fact that Colt Cabana stopped appearing on AEW television, or I guess showing up backstage to not work AEW television in many cases, uh, which uh, the elite camp blamed on CM Punk. So it all leads to all out CM Punk lost the championship to John Moxley on TV, wins it back in the main event. It's time for one of the another one of those weird ho hum press scrums that Tony Khan insists on happen, having at four in the morning after AEW pay per views. We've seen them all before; they're never interesting, except for this one, which starts out with CM Punk with what was very clearly a practiced and prepared statement. I love this man; he's so cool. <laughs> he's so cool. <laughs> um, uh, where he calls out Nick Hausman specifically and asks if he is friends with Colt Cabana. Uh, Mr. Hausman says, no, no, I am not, uh, which kind of throws Punk off. But hey, he's got this practiced. So he moves on anyway and begins to just just <laughs> again, you talk about making a list of enemies and uh, he he insults Hangman Page some more. He insults the elite, says that they were idiots who couldn't manage a target, uh, says that no one, including Hangman Page, who was the world champion for six months of the company Punk is currently working for, has never done anything in this business. Uh, and uh, and ends that after, after his rant, yells at Brian Alvarez a little bit, and then uh, ends his rant and says, uh, you know, despite what you might think, I'm actually a nice guy. And uh, also mentioned at some point that, hey, if anyone has a problem with me, my door is open. And everyone thought that was going to be the end of it. That was going to be the big, exciting talking point. But then if you watch the scrum, we see a security guard run out the door very rapidly at one point and come to find out in the wee hours of the morning, uh, Monday morning, uh, Labor Day, (laughs) CM Punk and Matt Jackson and Nick Jackson and Kenny Omega and Ace Steel and Larry the Dog got in a fight. 
and there was fighting and there was biting and there were punches thrown and there were suspensions. And now we are facing down the barrel of CM Punk barely one year into his big heroic baby kissing five slapping comeback. It's it's over and Punk looks to be on his way out of the company. Uh, all of this because Colt Cabana, because Tony Khan wasn't going to re-sign Colt Cabana's contract. I think you covered it. <laughs> it was, it's just, and we talked about this on the show at the time, so we don't need to go into it in too much detail, but there's so many clips of CM Punk talking about how when a veteran would try to give him advice, he refused to listen. Yes. Because he knew that he was right. And that ultimately, because he became such a big star, uh, he was vindicated. Uh, And that there's even a clip specifically where he says, uh, I hope in 10 years there's some younger punk kids that come up to me and tell me I'm old and out of touch because that's how the wrestling business should be. (laughs) And yet, here we are. It's the never-ending cycle. It's the never-ending cycle. Was this always the way it was going to end? I mean, maybe not with fisticuffs. I don't know if anyone thought there was going to be a fist fight, but was there was there a scenario where Punk works here for three or four years, has a nice career, and rides off into the sunset, and everybody looks at him as a Hall of Famer and a great guy, or was he always going to be this like lightning rod of of just bouncing from, you know, left WWE in an uproar. Again, he accused them of medical negligence that almost killed him. It's not a one-to-one comparison to how he left AEW or might be leaving AEW. But is was this always going to end with Punk getting big mad and walking out again? I think uh, the track record says... This wasn't going to end well. I don't know that anyone imagined it would explode in fisticuffs in uh, 53 weeks after he arrived. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, this is what I like to call vintage CM Punk. (laughs) You know, something happens and you see it and it's like, hey, there's the guy I know. (laughs) He is, at his core, the meanest human being on the planet. Yep. And uh, and that side of punk came back. And it's a shame, you know, even now, I think there's a feeling like, man, we could, uh, you know, just get these guys in a room and everybody could be an adult and apologize and we can really make some money off this. There's a non-zero chance that that happens. Yes, there was. And which is, uh, I think, been uh, exacerbated or or maybe that's not the right word. The chances have increased, I feel, in the last couple of months of 2022 with how heavy handed the elite has been referencing him since uh, since they came back. Of course, the the match over Thanksgiving uh, week in Chicago, where they played heels and acted out the bite and the failed buckshot lariat and all of that. Um, certainly, it certainly seems more likely than ever that at least more likely than it did in the early uh, morning hours of Labor Day uh, (laughs) that he could come back. But as of now, if he does come back, what's to say this doesn't happen all over again? Maybe not the fist fight part, but, you know, we we still don't we still don't quite know the specifics of his contract, my understanding. So. There's uh they did they did take him off the cover of the video game. So another one to uh to take our the other part of this that got buried in it because of all of the crazy funny stuff is that he also tore his tricep in that match uh with Moxley. So he would have been gone <laughs> for six to eight months probably anyway, which is maybe another reason why he decided to uh to just light everything on fire before he left. <laughs> Because uh, as as the Hangman Page call out showed, he was not a man who was uh, letting wounds heal with time. So uh, yeah, so that that ended up being again in any other year, it would be the biggest story of the year. But I think the Vince thing, 
kind of uh, skews that. And then just uh, just a little bit later after that, we did have the death of outside of Vince McMahon, probably the most you know successful promoter of his generation, a larger than life figure, that being Anoki san uh antonio inoki um and as you call him inoki <laughs> yes as he's known to his his students myself being one of them um inoki san uh antonio inoki died uh after ha- had had some health troubles over the last couple of years um pro wrestling as it exists in japan would not exist if not for inoki so it was it's unfathomable what he meant to to wrestling and more i guess moreover what he meant to culture <laughs> it pop culture in in japan he was a politician he he was in movies and he was he was he was a sports star in a way that you know wrestlers wrestlers obviously in this era aren't seen but he was he was he was like ali he was like the beatles he was like he was just this complete other level of celebrity that just doesn't exist anymore as, as we sort of touched on at the time. Yeah. Tremendous star. He did a match with Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. He uh, heard it explained that he was uh, Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan rolled into one person. That's the level of star and uh, even bigger than that uh, mm-hmm. culturally and um, founder of new Japan pro wrestling and company that's still going here 50 years later. And uh, even though he almost killed the company <laughs> uh, after about uh, 30, 35 of those years, um, everyone made peace at the end and they decided that he is going to be this figure. It is going to be, even though his, I think both political careers he had ended in disgrace mm-hmm. <laughs> and he has a reputation for not being an honest, an honest man or an honest promoter um, as usual with these larger than life wrestling figures there's good there's bad his stardom is absolutely undeniable the fact that he reached a level of fame that no one is capable of reaching today because of uh, globalization and just how fractured uh, culture and entertainment is Mm -hmm. uh, that can't be denied and uh, yeah that's uh, that's Antonio (laughs) Inoki Yeah, I think you kind of hit it on there. He 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 had a match with Muhammad Ali, and it's not the most noteworthy thing about him. Like that's right. uh, that's that's pretty insane. Uh, just just a mammoth, larger than life uh, <laughs> character in every step of the word, and just an all time great carny. Like like you talk like if the Ra- Mount Rushmore of carny promoters, it's like you got. I think you got to have Fritz on there. One of my new favorite. Like I've really done a deep dive into Fritz von Erich since we did our Thanksgiving spectacular this year. What a what a fascinating man! Uh, yeah, but you got to have Vince, obviously, and then I think Anoki is a is a no brainer as well. And then that fourth one, you can probably it's probably Vern, but maybe we could do better than Vern. But uh, but yeah, just an all time great uh, Carney promoter and and so much more as you said and. Before we get out of here, we do have a couple honorable mentions. I'll just run through quickly. Obviously, Jeff Hardy was released by WWE, signed by AEW, uh, got pulled over for drunk driving, and was suspended indefinitely by AEW, uh, all in the span of like two months. <laughs> uh, we had that moment. We had uh, Big E, of course, having his very serious neck injury because uh, someone thought it was a great idea to have Ridge Holland give him an overhead belly-to-belly suplex on the floor in just a random SmackDown match that nobody cared about. Uh, we have, have uh, we have KG Muto announcing he's <laughs> he announced his retirement and then has proceeded to have like 57 last matches, which I really respect. Because I, I guess it's yes. a retirement tour. It's not he didn't just announce his retirement. It's a retirement tour, but it's I, I love the idea of a guy who's gonna spend a whole year uh saying goodbye yeah but we have that another another giant of, of japanese wrestling obviously and <laughs> speaking of japanese wrestling there was that whole thing where uh, uh you know koto has been hurt since uh, before the start of this year but uh he was he began to be advertised for some dates by new japan uh in the spring this year uh, at which point he uh just decided to go just full scorched earth 
including among other things, including them accusing them of being in bed with the Yakuza and uh, and saying that they didn't care about their their wrestler safety, which I, I think is kind of undeniably true. If you watch them try it out, Tetsuya Naito and Hiroshi Tanahashi like five nights a week. And he indirectly blamed them for his mother attempting to commit suicide and breaking her back in the process. Ah, yes. Just, jeez. Just, <laughs> just, uh, just amazing. Uh, just an amazing bit of time there. And uh, it looks like maybe the word is he's going to be, he's going to be a free agent in 2023. So we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll see if and when he pops up anywhere else. But, uh, and then, yeah, the last one that, that came to mind was this, uh, the MJF work shoot saga, which uh, I think we talked about on the show at the time. It was super interesting when he no showed the meet and greet and was allegedly going to get on a plane and fly back to Long Island the night before uh, Double or Nothing in May. But then when when it became clear it was a storyline by the following Wednesday night, it got severely less interesting to me. Yeah, no argument. Um, work shoots suck. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I just just think as a general rule it's not a great idea to make a storyline about how the company sucks. <laughs> and you don't want to be there and you want to go work for the other guys. They came to that realization also at some point and yet continued uh mm-hmm. putting him on TV and in fact made him their world champion. So they're uh, you know, Tony Khan plays 40 chess while we're playing checkers. <laughs> That's right. That's, that's what I have to add to that. So that was, I think, we can all agree the the biggest news stories of of twenty twenty two in the in the pro wrestling world. Um, just I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, and uh, like we said, like we've already touched on. Hey, maybe Punk will be back. Maybe Vince will be back. Uh, you know, we'll we'll see. There, maybe twenty twenty three will be even crazier. But as far as like a bunch of almost generational defining or or five year, 10 year period defining things happening in a single year. 2022 is a hard act to follow. It always is. What? (laughs) (laughs) Ric Flair's second annual last match. KG KG Muto's second annual (laughs) retirement tour. (laughs) Oh, Hopefully a second annual press conference brawl in AEW. Yes, I hope that becomes a yearly tradition. And I hope uh, the press, the uh, media scrums uh, uh, stop, though. I hope they just fight. <laughs> yeah, we can just hear about it you know, overnight. We don't have to have a press conference first. We don't really have to have Tony Khan lecturing the media for 45 minutes interspersed with uh, five wrestlers doing kayfabe promos. Hey, uh... It's really not a good use of anyone's time. Hi Tony Storm, what's it like to be the champion? You don't you don't enjoy that? Well, it's great. <laughs> oh, oh, who do you want to wrestle next? Whoever they put in front of me. Yeah. It's like that's it. It's just that with five different people over and over again. Thank God for CM Punk. <laughs> Refuses to be boring that man. Yeah. <laughs> and I know on that note. We appreciate everybody for listening. It's been a good year for our show. Our our Spotify rap showed us showed us gaining a lot of new listeners and subscribers this year. So we appreciate you if you're a newer listener to the show. Uh, follow us at TWL underscore podcast. And hey, if you do listen to the show and the app you listen to us on uh, allows you to leave us a review, uh, give us five stars and leave a review, please. It'll help. It'll help our little show out. Uh, we appreciate that. We try to take it easy on the plugs most of the time, but it's the end of the year. So I'm just going to beg now. Um, just please, please leave a review for our show and, and give us five stars and subscribe to us on YouTube. Also, you can find us at TWL underscore podcast on YouTube. Also find us on Instagram at TWL underscore podcast. Lots of places to interact with us. Tell us what you think of our list. Is there a big news story we forgot? Let us know. Should we have added Mandy Rose getting fired for because Albert found her nudes? Uh, should that have been on our list? Let us know, and uh, and we will see you in the new year. Uh, but until next time, I'm Liam. I'm Ethan. And we'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of life. Happy New Year.
Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I watched, yeah, I watched the England-France game, and I think I watched... I watched when Croatia was Croatia beat Brazil in penalties. That was awesome. Yeah, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good penalties uh, games last week. It's one of those things where me, as someone who barely or never watches soccer, I'm like, I watch that and I'm like, I think sudden, like you know, end of game penalty kicks are like the most exciting thing in all of sports. <laughs> yes, like. It's amazing. And you wouldn't you can't have the whole game be like that. I understand. Yes. But it but it in and of itself, if you can get through the 90 minutes and then the overtime period and the arbitrary amount of time added on when the clock runs past where it's supposed to stop. Yes. Uh it's like and you get to that, it's like, okay, now it's time for a reward. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you get the most exciting you know, 10 minutes in all of sports. Are right, you wrapping up the show or am I? <laughs> I feel like you should. Okay. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year! I try to keep on keeping on